Okay, this video is brain anatomy for medical students. There's been a couple of medical students who've told me that they're overwhelmed by their neuroanatomy classes and they wish somebody could give them an overview of brain anatomy that'll help them to be able to add the details in. Because a lot of times when medical students are taught anatomy, they teach them all this minute detail, but the students don't even have the big picture understanding yet. They don't know the general overview of the brain. Um, I'll actually show you the first thing about the brain you should look at, the, at your, the side of your fist. Okay, this right here, your thumb, that's the temporal lobe. In front, that's the frontal lobe. This little crease right here, that's the central sulcus of Rolando. Right behind it, that is the parietal lobe. And then right behind that is the occipital lobe. The more you go in front anterior, the more abstract the thought. The more also that, that's more what's human about us. The more you make judgments. The frontal lobes are sort of the, the human part of the brain where you can make decisions, you can delay gratification, plan for the future. Okay, you can get yourself to do the thing you don't want to do. Um, the central sulcus is a dividing line between the motor cortex and the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus being, you know, sensory cortex like touch, uh, pressure sense, uh, vibratory sense, position sense, kinesthetic sense. Okay, the occipital lobe is, we think of it as being purely sensory for vision. There's a tremendous amount of neurons in the brain are devoted to vision. All right, so remember that though. All the way in the back, pure sensory. Dividing line between motor and sensory is the central sulcus. Temporal lobe is especially for auditory, but there's other interesting things about the temporal lobe. Uh, but yeah, just get that as a fist and you can quickly remember, you know, the four lobes of the brain. All right. Then the next question to ask yourself is what is the purpose of a brain? Why do animals have brains? Voltaire asked that question. Why do animals have brains? but plants do not. And it's because animals move. Okay, once you're aware of that idea of the animal moving, you know, why do we have a brain? So you can walk down a path in a forest or a jungle or a prairie and survive. The purpose of your brain is to keep you alive. You know, it's long enough that you can reproduce, okay, and you know, carry the genes on into the next generation. All right, so this is a drawing of a sea squirt. And during its juvenile phase, it swims around like a tadpole and it has a brain. Whereas in its adult phase, it attaches to a rock and becomes a filter feeder and its brain is entirely reabsorbed. Because you don't need a brain if you just sit around watching TV all day. Okay? This is also part of the whole story why exercise makes you smarter. It's very good for the brain. Okay. Um, and, and getting yourself to think. You know, there's always a good reason and there's a real reason. Those are just some good thinking quotes. Okay, but... Um, Let's see, we're not going to get into all that stuff today. One thing I would say about the brain is, you know, how do you remember anything? The way you remember anything is you associate it with something you already know. And that's how the brain maps cognitive space, through comparisons. You know, comparisons, you know, are analogies, simil similes with as or like, or metaphors just saying something is something else. And that's how we map cognitive space. I'm going to talk in a little while later about how the brain maps other things. Just a tiny bit about neurophysiology. We're not going to go into much detail about this. This is a neuron. It's plasma membrane. And by the way, you know, I, I used to primarily work as an imaging guided surgeon, interventional radiologist. Now I mostly work as a neuroradiologist, reading brain MRIs and brain CTs. But I still do some imaging guided surgery, and I still do some general radiology. Okay, but you know, my favorite area is the brain. Okay, so here is a typical plasma membrane of a neuron. About 50% to two-thirds of the energy is devoted to this uh, potassium-sodium ATPase pump. And it pumps in two potassium while pumping out three sodium. And it uses an ATP, that's the adenosine triphosphate energy currency. So the point of the matter is, if a neuron is using two-thirds of its energy, to, or half the two-thirds of its energy to do something, that's very, very, very important. And it generates an electrical battery you know, stored energy across the plasma membrane, the outer membrane of the neuron cell. It creates a negative gradient in the cell, negative 65 millivolts, okay, and that is an electrical gradient. There's also a concentration gradient because a lot of sodium is pumped out. So sodium becomes 10 times higher in concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. And then you can harvest that gradient by allowing sodium to enter the cell. Here we have the knockout exchanger, means sodium-potassium exchanger. Natrium is the Latin word for sodium, so that's why Na is the abbreviation for sodium. Ca is for calcium, okay, and you can abbreviate it even more, NCX, exchanger. So by harvesting this grading and letting sodium come in, we can then pump out calcium. 
Calcium also has a much higher concentration outside the cell than it does inside the cell. So that's real important because calcium is the on-off switch in neurons. When you increase calcium inside the cell, it will release its neurotransmitter. So you pump calcium out of the cell so you don't keep uh, releasing neurotransmitter and wasting energy for no reason. So here is the electrochemical battery effect of the plasma membrane of a neuron. You've got the negative electrical gradient, negative 65 millivolt charge inside the neuron, and you've got the, the chemical gradient with sodium 10 times higher outside than inside the neuron. And so again, you make that by using this ATP-dependent pump, and then you can harvest that gradient to do other work, like pump calcium out of the cell. The calcium concentration outside the cell is dramatically higher than it is inside the cell. It's like 15,000 times higher. That's how much higher it is. It's, it's enormous. But you'll do all kinds of other things with these ion pumps. You know, you'll, you'll bring other things into the cell that you want to bring in, like amino acids. You'll pump things out that you want to get rid of, like uh, protons, the acid, and whatnot. When you have high calcium inside a cell, the cell will do whatever is like the main thing that it does. So for a neuron, that'll typically be to release a neurotransmitter. So when you get high cytoplasm concentration of calcium, you will release your neurotransmitter. In this case, it's glutamate. Glutamate is about 90% of the brain neurotransmitters, and it's excitatory, meaning that it exerts an excitatory effect on the postsynaptic cell that it, that it diffuses over to across the synaptic cleft. So you need to know that. You need to know that calcium activates cells. You need to know that glutamate is 90% of brain neurotransmitters. It's excitatory. Those are all essential things you need to know. And I'm, I'm getting kind of technical in this talk because the purpose of this is to help medical students understand the basics of neuroanatomy so they can pass their tests and later on learn more about the neuroanatomy. This is not one of my general health talks. This is for, you know, medical students getting ready to take exams. Okay, um, when you look at a neuron here, you have the cell body in this area here with the nucleus, and that's where a lot of uh, metabolic activity occurs, a lot of mitochondria in this area. You have incoming messages received on dendrites. Dendrite means like dendron, a tree. So they're tree-like extensions, uh, and these will receive neurotransmitters, and they're basically receiving information from the adjacent neurons. If this neuron decides that it wants to fire an action potential, it gets activated by messages coming in through the dendrites. The action potential will begin in the region of the axon hillock. It'll travel down the axon to reach the synaptic terminal. In the synaptic terminal, if it is activated, it will then, this NT is for neurotransmitters, it will release a neurotransmitter that goes to the, the plasma membrane and then travels across a synaptic cleft. This is the postsynaptic neuron. This is a wrapping of fat around the, the axon of the neuron, which speeds up conduction. These gaps between the fat wrapping, it's called myelin, are called nodes of Ranvier, and the conduction is going to jump between these spots. Okay, so the initial conduction of the action potential is through sodium channels, whereby sodium is allowed to come into the cell and we're temporarily reverse that negative resting membrane potential. And that's called depolarization of the cell. And then the conduction jumps across these nodes of, Ran, uh, of Ranvier, and that's called saltatory to jump. Um, and then a calcium channel is opened up here, a voltage-gated calcium channel, and that allows calcium to come into the postsynaptic, the presynaptic neurons, you know, synaptic terminal. And then that elevation in calcium will cause the neurotransmitter vesicles to merge with the plasma membrane of the presynaptic neuron, diffuse across this cleft, activate the postsynaptic neuron. So that's about the extent that we're going to go into a tiny bit more, but not much neurophysiology of individual neurons. We're going to go more into gross anatomy, things you can see with your eye. Okay, just a tiny bit more here on um, neurophysiology. So here's a neurotransmitter coming across. In this case, it would be serotonin, for example. Serotonin binds with a receptor on the postsynaptic neuron, and it will exert an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Now, you can take a medicine. For example, a lot of these antidepressant medicines are SSRIs, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. So typically when this neurotransmitter was released, it diffuses across the cleft, exerts an effect, and then it's taken back up into the presynaptic neuron, and it'll be restored to be used again. Whereas sometimes you can block the reuptake, which is going to lead to the neurotransmitter being in the cleft a more prolonged amount of time because it's not being you know, suctioned out of there, so to speak. However, when a person is chronically on these medications, they will induce adaptations. For example, the postsynaptic neuron here, this one has a whole bunch of receptors. This will be a virgin postsynaptic neuron. But after they've been on SSRIs for a while, they might 
downregulate, decrease the number of postsynaptic receptors. They might also increase the amount of uh, serotonin reuptake transporters, so they're compensatory changes. The brain cells are fighting the drug. They don't want to accept this at face value, okay? And then another point I would make is neurons are more complicated. You'll initially learn neurons as having one neurotransmitters, but when you study them some more, you'll see that synapses are more complicated than that. It can have inputs from several different types of neurotransmitters. And the big, the big neurotransmitter for activation I told you was glutamate. That's about, let's just say about 90% of brain neurotransmitters. And then the next most important brain neurotransmitter is GABA. So glutamate turns things on, GABA turns things off. And let's just ballpark GABA at being 5% of neurons. It depends what part of the brain you're in, but call it 5%. And then you've got like about 1% or less of all these other neurotransmitters. So the kind of the funny thing is glutamate's the most important neurotransmitter, over 90% of the neurotransmitters in the brain, call it 90%. But you, most people don't know much about glutamate, but then they've all heard about serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. And those things are relatively uncommon. You know, you're just talking in the ballpark of 1% or less, all right? So, but the point I want to make is it's almost like an orchestra, a symphony that all works together. It's a very uh, sophisticated, complicated thing. Okay, now we're going to talk about the vertical anatomy of the brain. And this is something called the three-part brain of McLean. He was a neuroanatomist. And the vertical part of the brain is the bottom part is the brain stem. This is the cervical spinal cord, connects to the medulla of the brain stem, then the pons, big pons belly sticks out right here. This is the midbrain. It's called the midbrain because it's right in the middle of the brain. Uh, in the back of the posterior fossa, there's a dividing line right here. Stuff below this is posterior fossa. This is also called supertentorial brain. The dividing line is called a tent, like a, you camp in a tent. And the tent separates the supertentorial brain from the infratentorial brain. This is the cerebellum back here, and it's relatively small, but this little cerebellum contains about 70% of the neurons in the brain. And it's because the fine little interneurons for coordinating something like writing with a pen and other fine hand movements, that's partly why humans are so smart, because they can do delicate things with their hands. That uses up about 70% of the brain's neurons. So there's approximately 100 billion neurons in the brain, and 70% of them are in that cerebellum. And that enables us to be really coordinated. Okay, so the brain stem is also called the reptile brain, and it's primitive. Like the, you know, it's also like Freud's id. It just wants food, sex, and that's it. Okay, it's very simple and primitive. Okay, the next level up of the brain is shaped like the letter C on a Chicago Bears football helmet, and that's the cingulate gyrus continuing through the isthmus into the medial temporal lobe, which you can't see on this drawing, but that is called the mammal brain, like the letter C on a Chicago Bears helmet, and that is. Um, still quite impulsive and emotional, but more thoughtful. A mammal has live born young, it has to nurse them, take care of them. It's still very fast and impulsive, okay, like your dog, a mammal. All right, and then the, and it's also called limbic, because limbic means edge, and right at the medial edge of the brain, um, that's where this is located. Now, the next thing up is the supertentorial brain or the cerebral cortex. And this is sometimes called the primate brain or the human brain. Our cerebral cortex is like three times bigger than a chimp, okay? We're way more sophisticated than chimps. I don't buy that chimps being such a close relative to us. I think that's misleading. All right, well, anyways, the supertentorial brain is where your, all your more advanced features are, especially in the frontal lobe. That's where you do your more sophisticated thinking, your individual personality and whatnot. So this is the point I wanted to make about the vertical brain. From an evolutionary point of view, they'll say this is the primitive reptile-like brain, then a mammal brain was added onto that, and then a primate human brain was added onto that. Okay, So that's how you can conceptualize the vertical brain. Um, the next thing we would talk about then is the anterior to posterior brain. Anterior brain is abstract thought, human thought, and it's planning or what you want to do. Then the motor cortex right here is primary motor. So once you made a decision what you want to do, like let's say there's a fruit tree over there, the food looks good, I'm going to go get some food, I will walk towards the fruit tree, it sends a message to the precentral gyrus, and that will then send path uh, neurons down to the uh, spinal cord to activate your arms and legs, so you move over to the fruit tree and get some food. Okay, the posterior part of the brain is mostly sensory, and like pure sensory occipital lobe for the most part. Okay, um, and then, you know, <clears throat> somatosensory touch, proprioception, vibratory sense right here in the postcentral gyrus, temporal lobes on the side, remember the hand showing in the side, that's where auditory sensation is, and then where they all kind of come together, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, that's the multimodal association cortex to integrate that 
information, put it together, start making sense out of it, and then send it over to the frontal lobes, okay? But this three-part brain is useful. And so how does this relate to your own personal life? Let's say you're talking with your, your, your girlfriend, your wife, and, you know, she's kind of yapping at you, you know, she's giving you a hard time because you didn't do something she wanted you to do, and you feel like saying something rude back to her, but then your frontal lobe says, no, don't do that. If you say something rude to her, she'll be mad at you tomorrow too. She won't sleep with you that night. So I better be thoughtful and be nice. And I kind of do deserve to get yapped at. So it's my fault. Okay, I'm sorry, sweetheart. All right, so what I'm trying to say is your super tentorial gives you the ability to think, to ask yourself, what are the long-term consequences of this? What effect do I want to have in my conversation with her? You know, my relationship with her in the long run is much more important than this little moment where I think she's criticizing me unfairly. So what I'm trying to say is your, your frontal lobes, your supersensorial brain gets you to be thoughtful. Think about the long-term consequences of your behavior so you can make more intelligent decisions. Okay, and that's, of course, very important. Moravac's paradox relates to and so, like I said, when I feel like saying something impulsive or rude, I go, hey, I'm getting into a mammal, limbic, emotional mood. I've got to be in a more thoughtful, cerebral cortex, super, uh, human brain mood, okay, and be more wise about how I talk and behave. Moravic's paradox is just that they thought it would be hard to get a brain to do calculus or something like that, which we think must be an intellectual challenging for the brain. But the reality is the brain's much more focused on movement and vision than it is on thinking. Okay, they can make a calculator do calculus back in the 1950s, and they're still just barely able to get these robots to move like humans can. Okay, it's a much more difficult thing. So that was Moravic's paradox. The hard thing was easy, the easy thing was hard, as far as what they originally thought. Okay, now we're going to talk about the concept of networks in the brain. So these networks are ways that the brain handles different things. So the default mode network, you can hear, you can especially think of it as being in the cingulate gyrus, which is right here. I'll go through the anatomy in a little more detail in just a moment. So if you put a patient on a functional MRI table, tell them to close their eyes, and you ask them, so what are you thinking about? They're usually going to say about their relationship. You know, yesterday my girlfriend, she got ticked off of me. She wanted to go to a movie, and I didn't want to go to the movie because I had to study. So she's still a little annoyed with me. So today, you know, I got more time tonight. We'll go to the movie tonight. Okay. So you're thinking about what happened yesterday, the past, and then you're thinking about what you're going to do tonight or tomorrow, the future. So what I'm basically saying here is the default mode network is to think about our relationships with other people, what happened, and what we want to do in the future. So that's how the brain maps time the past and the future default mode network. And the reason why we think about social relationships is because they're important for us. Humans don't do very well, you know, when they're on their own. They, they do much better in life when they've got some social relationships and they benefit from interacting with other people. Okay, so that's a key point though. Default mode network is in the center of the brain primarily and it's focused on past and future, whereas task-based network is on the outer surface of the brain, the convexities, and they are much, they are pulling you into the present, you know, doing something at work or school, Focusing on the moment, and this is also why, uh, can you already see how this is beneficial to you? If somebody's upset, anxious, depressed, they're obsessing. Oh, you know, I acted like such a jerk yesterday. Now my, the, the woman in my love is going to dump me. I'm such a screw up. Why did I act like such an asshole? Okay, so what I'm trying to say is they're obsessing about something, whatever it might be. And so one of the best things they could do is get into busy with a task. Start lifting weights, going for exercise, or, or help somebody else with their problems. Because when you get busy with a task, you activate this other part of your brain. You can only really significantly be focused on one thing at a time. Our conscious mind can only handle one general category of things at a time. So if you're busy doing some present task, you know, raking the leaves, cleaning your room, or doing whatever it is that you're doing, working, helping somebody, you are now pulled into the present. And that gets you to forget about what you were obsessing about past and future why? So that's why it's very helpful to get busy as a treatment for depression, anxiety, and other psychological conditions, post-traumatic stress disorder and whatnot. Okay, the next thing is the salience network. The salience network is right here along the insular cortex. So this is the insula right in here, like an island, and that notices things. So salience means something that gets your attention. So imagine you're having a conversation with another person and there's a TV set on there. And the TV, there's motion. You keep on looking at the TV. You can't help it because your eyeballs on the outer periphery, you've got the rods for black and white vision. And they're very sensitive to motion. So they see the motion, they're always going to keep looking. 
The reason you look is so you have the peripheral motion sensors of your, your rods, black and white vision, then you turn your head so you get both eyes focused on the thing, stereoscopic vision, and your cones are color vision and they're very concentrated in their density close together so they can see very fine resolution. So that's how the, our, our brain works. And it is made to make us survive. Because if there's motion and you're out in the forest or the jungle, that means a predator or animal might be coming towards you about to kill you. So you better look real fast, see what it is, and then make a decision on what you need to do. Um, so that's how it works. But how does that relate to your regular life? Well, if you're studying, you don't want any distractions. You're only going to be able to concentrate on one thing at a time. So get your phone out of the room. Do not have your email on. No bells or beeps or anything. If other people are talking and making noise, get some ear protectors. You can't, you can't close your ears. So you, you want to, in a sense, close your ears by doing this. Um, minimize your distractions. You'll be able to concentrate better. Remember that quote of Rosenich. He said, if, how do you improve a brain? You train it. You practice, practice, practice. And how do you degrade the function of a brain? You distract it with noise. Okay. You can add auditory noise. You can add visual noise. Um, so anyways, that's how it works. And so these are the three major networks of the brain. Default mode network, mapping past and, pre and, past and future, so tra time traveling. And then task-based network is being engaged in a task, getting into the present. So you forget about that other salience. is just whatever currently distracts you. And like I said earlier, the way we map cognitive space is through analogies, through comparisons. You know, we judge. That is a cat because it barks bow wow. Um, it has a tail. It walks on all fours. That is a... That is a dog because it barks. Bow wow. That is a cat because it says meow. So that's how we categorize things and we compare them. Okay. Dogs tend to be bigger than cats. Um, anyways, that's that's how we categorize everything. Okay. Okay. Here's right and left brain. This guy Ian McGilchrist is a psychiatrist. He wrote a good book about right and left brain. It's called The Master and the Emissary. He's kind of long-winded. <laughs> you know, what do you expect from a psychiatrist, okay? But he's smart and he's nice. Um, left brain language, and I remember L for left brain language, and it's linear. It's logical. It's sort of deductive logic, like a predator, like the dog's using his left brain. It sees the bird here and it says, that bird is probably about 10, 15 feet away from me. If I run really fast, kind of quiet, I can maybe catch the bird and eat it. Okay, that's deductive logic. 10 feet, I'm going 20 miles an hour, I could catch it before it takes off. All right, whereas inductive logic, like the bird is, that's like the right brain. That's more, so deductive logic is when you have complete information and you make a calculation. Inductive logic is more like uh, a praise brain. Okay, there's this dog about 10, 15 feet away from me. I think I could fly faster than he could get me. Oh crap, there's a raccoon uh, on top of the fence there and he might try to pounce on me. I better start maybe moving in this other direction. Oh crap, there's a hawk up there in the air. I probably should fly this way because the hawk won't be able to fly at me when I'm near these bushes. It will crash into the bushes. Okay, so the, the prey mentality has to kind of put all that stuff together. Okay, and it's been said that men and women think a little bit differently. Men have more of a predator mentality. Women have a little bit more of a prey mentality. And they see and think about the world differently. Okay, the left side of the brain is also Apollonian, like Apollo. Again, that logical, clear, deductive thinking. And it tends to really overestimate how smart it is and what it can do. Versus the right brain is different. Even though you think of the left brain, L for language, the right brain is more called Dionysian, like Dionysus. A little bit more wild and crazy and in some ways a lot more fun, okay? It's more emotional. It's more about when it turns, when it relates to language, it relates to metaphors and to jokes and to music, to singing, to humor, to laughter, to looking at the big picture. Um, it tends to be a little more pessimistic. So this is also called the artistic brain. And this is more of like the, the book scholar type of brain. So this is more simple speech, the left brain. Please pass the salt. Thank you. Okay, that type of conversation. Whereas the right brain is more jokes, like the Rodney Dangerfield joke. What's the difference between having an arranged marriage versus marrying for love? You can spend the rest of your life blaming your parents instead of yourself. Okay, so and there's people when they have a stroke, they might lose the ability to speak in regular language if they have a left brain stroke, but they might still be able to sing, for example. All right, and so um, the right brain kind of gets the jokes, the rhymes, the metaphors. So they're both important for language, just uh, in a slightly different way. Um, so then we talked about right brain and left brain. By the way, you can tell, imagine if, if you came into a room and my feet and my hands were pointing towards you. That would be how you always know what side you're looking at. So imagine you're looking at a person in a room sitting on a CAT scan table, for example, or an MRI table. 
This would be the right side because you were like looking at their face. This would be the right side. This would be the left side. It's always that way on CAT scans, on MRIs, on X-rays, on ultrasound. That is standard conventional interpretation of an image in all of imaging. And you need to know that so you'd be able to know what side is what. Okay, um, we talked about the networks. We talked about the right and left brain, how the brain's a little bit different from right side to left side. This is the corpus callosum. It goes side to side and it connects the right brain to the left brain. This right here is a cingulate gyrus. And default mode network is more related to the cingulate gyrus and the corpus callosum. I just wrote it this way because there's more space there. And that goes mostly anterior and posterior and, you know, talking down into the medial temporal lobe, for example. This stuff will start making more sense when I start showing you the pictures from the side. Okay, this is just showing, you know, the hippocampus means like seahorse, like in Greek. And that's the main spot of our memory, our declarative memory, remembering things that you can say, you know, that is green this is gray this is the gray matter ribbon around the periphery of the brain that's where the cell bodies are of the neurons this stuff in the center here is mostly the axons and they're also coated with fat in this area myelin okay so this tends to be lower in density fats low density um, in terms of its uh, gross anatomy and cat scan appearance for example there's more cell bodies here. There's more blood supply. Let's say there's in the ballpark of four times more blood supply to the gray matter ribbon. So it's denser when you look at it on a CAT scan. Cortex means bark, like the bark of the tree. You want to know these words when you, when you see them coming up a lot because it, it'll just mean the periphery. So all the cell bodies of the supertentorial brain are in the periphery except for the deep nuclei. These are the deep nuclei of the basal ganglia. Okay, that's where there's concentrations of cell bodies. Okay, and they're also going to have a lot of blood supply and be denser on... CAT scan denser on uh, gross anatomy. The hippocampus is also very sensitive to being deprived of glucose or oxygen. So if a person has a code blue and they're hypotensive, they can damage their memory center quite uh, significantly. Okay, this level of the brain, at the level of the, this is the third ventricle here, these are the lateral ventricles, they're filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So at the level of the third ventricle, when especially at the level of these big uh, basal nuclei. This is the globus pallidus. This is the putamen. I'll explain those terms a little more in just a moment. This level is called the basal ganglia level. Then you go the next level up at the level of the lateral ventricles. This blue stuff is for cerebral spinal fluid. This is called corona radiata. On other images you'll see it looks like a crown. Corona means crown. Radiata means to radiate out in a circle. Okay, um, That's where we see a lot of silent strokes. And then above that is the centrum semiovali because it's in the center, it's the white matter in the center where the myelinated fibers are. And if you look at it on an axial transverse section through the brain, um, it's in the center and it's semi-oval. It'll make sense on an axial image. Okay, right below the cortex is called subcortical. Okay, the outer surface of the cortex is called the pia. Uh, and this is the peel layer. Okay, um, so you need to know subcortical because you'll hear that phrase a lot. If something touches the ventricle, then that's called juxta. Juxta means like to yoke, like to yoke an ox on its neck, you know, for it can harness and you can plow a field. So juxta means to touch the ventricle. If it's near the ventricle but not touching it, we would call that paraventricular, or periventricular. Okay, um, so those are really the locations of lesions. This would be a juxta, juxtaventricular lesion, this would be a periventricular lesion, and this would be a subcortical lesion, anywhere near this gray matter uh, cerebral cortex. The internal carotid artery comes up into the brain. It'll bifurcate into the anterior cerebral artery, which I don't have on the drawing because it would make it too complicated, and the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery, typically abbreviated MCA, goes out over the convexities, okay? Ascending convexity branch of the MCA, descending convexity branch of the MCA. These small arteries that go up in the basal ganglia are called the lenticulostriates. And it's important to know about them because it's a very common area of stroke. Really hypertensive patients will often get a shearing injury at the base of these lenticulostriate arteries and they will get strokes in the basal ganglia and it will cause little holes in the brain called lacuna means hole and so you call them lacunar infarcts. I see those every day. I see lots of those every day. Okay, um, skull and crossbones are drawn here in the region of the corona radiata and the centrum semiovali because we get tons of um, strokes in this area. You can get them due to atherosclerosis from hypertension and diabetes. You also can get them due to overtreated hypertension where not enough blood gets to this area because there isn't very good collateralization of flow. And I think that's probably because our ancestors ate low-fat diets, so they didn't get atherosclerosis in this area, okay? Um, 
All right, so here's a coronal labeled image, and it's the same thing. So at this level would be what level? The basal ganglia level, by, based on these blue lines, like blue lines. So this is basal ganglia level. Next level up, the level of the lateral ventricles here, or the cerebral spinal fluid, this would be the coronal radiata level. And then above it, the deep white matter at this level would be CSO, centrum semiovale. Okay, CR right here is for coronal radiata. Um, I see at this level is internal capsule, which is where what we'll, we'll go into this in more detail once we look at axial image, which means transverse images. This is coronal. Coronal means from front to back. Okay, uh, C right here is for the caudate nucleus. H right here is for the hypothalamus. T is for thalamus. Um, then you should know this one though. GP is globus pallidus, and it's right next to the internal capsule, so I call globus pallidus pals with the internal capsule. And this is putamen. Putamen it sounds like put a man, like to put a man out. So you're pissed off your girlfriend, she you put you in the doghouse for the night. So you're on the outside over here, okay? Uh, we usually aren't going to go into the details of this. If you need to know it for your school, this would be called claustrum, external capsule, extreme capsule. And here's the insular cortex in here. Insula is like a little island, and it's covered on the outer part by the operculum. So remember this operculum is like a cover, and it covers the insular cortex. Because you can separate those two at gross anatomy inspection and you can then see the insula. That's going to be relevant in just a moment. We'll talk about that. But this is the overview of the coronal anatomy of the brain. Again, you know, this is right side because the feet are towards you. This is the left side. And this is the hippocampus in here, which is supposed to look like a seahorse. Okay, now we're looking at an axial or transverse section of the brain. And this is the same things we talked about, but now in a transverse image of the brain. So here's the globus pallidus and it's pals with the internal capsule. Here's a putamen to put a man out. It's on the outside relative to the globus pallidus. Okay, later I'm going to show you some CAT scans and show you how this has a tendency to get calcified in people as they get older, which is not good. Okay, we call it a normal variant, but it's not good. Okay, here's the caudate nucleus. We're not going to talk too much about that, but just so you know, it contacts the frontal horn. FH is for frontal horn because they're in the frontal lobes. OH is for occipital horns because this part of the ventricles is in the occipital lobe. Thalamus runs right next to the third ventricle here. I drew the name HAL, H-A-L, and that stands for head, arms, legs. And we're going to talk a little bit later about the cortical spinal tract and the fibers to the head go through the anterior part. This is the genu. Genu means knee, and here's the anterior limb of the internal capsule. Here's the genu. Here's the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So this is the internal capsule, and it's really shaped like a boomerang, okay? And then the little man named HAL lives in the posterior limb of the internal capsule, just meaning Fibers to the head, fibers to the arms, fibers to the legs, okay? That's the motor tract, cortico from the cortex, spinal to the spinal cord, okay? Um, the basal ganglia, I also jokingly call them stroke land for hypertensive patients. I see strokes in this area all day long, every day. Um, okay, so that's our basal ganglia level. So again, that would correspond to our basal ganglia level on this image. And again, hypertensive... Severe hypertension will cause injuries to these lenticular striate arteries, and you'll, you'll fill up with a type of atherosclerosis, and you'll get strokes in this area, lacunar infarcts, okay? And then right in here, though, in the deep white matter of the centrum semiovale and the corona radiata, that's where I see the most. I can in one day see like a thousand strokes in this area because they're often asymptomatic small strokes, often called silent strokes, but these are related to uh, dysfunction of these neurons. This is like the typical person having senior moments and being very slowed down, okay? And that's what I mean when I say somebody has a slow brain. They're very slow at processing things. Now, this is a more severe example of it. This is a Netter. I'm going to show you a little bit about Frank Netter's work. He's the best neuroanatomist in the history of the world. Okay, not best neuroanatomist, best anatomist overall, best anatomy artist. So here he's drawing uh, NPH, which is communicating hydrocephalus, also called... Um, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. The cerebral ventricles are big. Because they're big and swollen, they're exerting pressure on the rest of the brain here. Well, the CSF pressure is normal, but the way it works when you look at a brain MRI in these patients, the cerebral cortex is abnormally tight up against the skull in an old person. All right, Ventricles are big. The mnemonic, remember, this is wet because they have urinary incontinence, wobbly because they have unsteady gait, and, uh, wa and wacky is they're often confused and demented. So wet, wobbly, and wacky is the classic symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus communicating hydrocephalus, okay? It means big ventricles, all right? So here's Netter's Neuroscience Atlas, and if you're going to study neuroscience, I strongly recommend you buy this book. Netter's illustrations are the best ones for learning brain anatomy, okay? I've taught brain anatomy to many, many, many people, 
and to myself originally, and this is the best book for studying that. I'll just show you a little bit about a Netter picture. So here's Netter's view of the brain. Now when you first see a lateral surface of the brain, it's rather intimidating. Like remember I told you earlier, look at the fist. Temporal lobe, frontal lobe, central sulcus, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. I'm going to show you a trick in just a moment that you'll be able to memorize everything on the side of this brain like that. Okay. Now, most of you, you don't need to, but if you're taking a neuroanatomy class, and I expect you to know the anatomy of the cerebral convexities, the surface anatomy, the trick I'm about to show you is going to be very helpful to you. And I learned this from Tom Nadich. He's the most famous neuroradiologist in the world for the study of neuroanatomy. So here's the trick. You look at the sylvian fissure, which is the dividing line between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, and it looks like a snail. So here's the head of the snail, and then here's its anterior antenna, here's its posterior antenna, here's its body extending posteriorly, and then it extends upward a little bit. And this little blue thing, the snail, is the key to understanding everything about the uh, convexity anatomy of the brain. So remember, orbitalis, this is the operculum, this area right around the head and the antenna of the snail. So pars orbitalis means the opercular covering of the orbits. So this is right on top of the orbits. Pars triangularis, pars just means part. So between these two antenna is the triangular part. Pars opercularis is the covering, the operculum, really of the insula is what that refers to. But you can very quickly find the antennas, pars orbitalis because I'm on top of the orbit, triangularis because I'm a, it looks like a triangle, it's in between the antenna, and then opercularis is the posterior part, I know that covers the insula. Because as soon as you find that, then you'll find this. Here is the precentral sulcus. So a sulcus is a CSF spilled cl filled cleft between gyri. Gyri are the actual brain tissue. Sulci are the cleft, the, the fluid filled cleft. Okay, so here's the vertical uh, precentral sulcus. And as soon as you find that, you know the precentral gyrus is behind it. This is the primary motor cortex, okay? That's what gets your arms and legs to move and do stuff. And then right in between the precentral and the postcentral gyrus is the central sulcus, also called the central sulcus of Rolando. And so now you, you know how to make sense out of the frontal lobe, then in terms of what goes from top to bottom, superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus, superior frontal sulcus, inferior frontal sulcus. So that's all logical. You just need to know how to speak English to remember that. Superior, middle, inferior. All right? And then pre and post relative to the central sulcus. So we've been able to find all that stuff. And then now once you're behind that, now you've got a post central sulcus that also is orientated vertically. Okay? And these are run parallel to each other. And then the parietal lobe is divided into superior parietal lobule above, inferior parietal lobule below, and the intraparietal sulcus runs in between them. It's all pretty logical. When you follow the sylvian fissure up posteriorly, right at its posterior margin, there's what's called a supra on top of marginal uh, gyrus. Okay, and that's also called Wernicke's area. For you know, if you get a lesion there, you get receptive aphasia. You can't understand things. So that's Wernicke's area. That's a real famous area in the brain, and people hear about it all the time if you study it. If you follow the superior temporal sulcus posteriorly, you have the angular gyrus right on top of it, and that's also called Gerstmann's area, where it's related to counting numbers and math. And so if you have a stroke right there, you can't remember stuff too well, and that's sometimes called like the bad accountant stroke. The, if you get a stroke right there, you won't be able to count effectively. Okay, and then the temporal lobe is very much like the frontal lobe in terms of superior temporal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, inferior temporal gyrus, just like we have a superior, middle, and inferior uh, frontal gyrus. Okay. And then posterior back in here is occipital lobe, which is especially, we think of that as being purely sensory for vision. It's an oversimplification, but that's basically all we need to know that makes sense. And we remember we talked about the frontal gyrus is abstract thought, human thought, human individualization. And then temporal lobe right in here, for example, is auditory cortex. This is touch, vibration, position sense. This is visual sense. And they all come together in what's called the multimodal association uh, cortex, which is sort of the junction between the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And that sort of associates all that different sensory information, and then it gets sent over to the frontal lobes to make decisions. And that's how the brain gets stuff done. Okay, so now I just wanted to show you how this will all make sense once we, once we had gone through that stuff about um, the brain. So you just find the sylvian fissure, okay? Because I've now got that all lined in blue, my snail, snail's head, anterior ramus, posterior ramus of the antenna, I know that this covers the orbit, so that's pars orbitalis. This is triangular, pars triangularis. 
Pars just means part again. Okay, this is pars or percolaris. And now once I found this, I know I just followed up. I'm in the precentral gyrus. Behind, I'm in the precentral sulcus. Right behind that is precentral gyrus, primary motor. In between that is central sulcus of Rolando. So right behind that is postcentral gyrus. Okay, so that's touch, uh, vibratory sense, position sense. Right behind that, inferior parietal lobule, superior parietal lobule, interparietal sulcus. Okay, superior temporal sulcus, inferior temporal sulcus, thus superior temporal gyrus. Middle temporal gyrus, inferior temporal gyrus. Okay, superior frontal sulcus, inferior frontal sulcus. So superior frontal gyrus, middle frontal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus. I can find all this stuff very quickly. I know that this is the posterior margin of the sylvian uh, fissure, so this is supermarginal gyrus, also called Wernicke's area. This is the posterior margin of the superior temporal sulcus, so this is the angular gyrus, also called Gerstmann's area. And I know this is the occipital pole, occipital cortex back here. So by just getting this, we can find everything real quick. And that's how you remember stuff. So this is what I would call the irreducible minimum, understanding the sylvian fissure, from which you can derive all the rest of the anatomy. Okay, here's some CAT scans, and this is just, you know, the dark stuff in here is the fluid in the lateral ventricles. Um, and this patient has an old uh, cerebral hematoma, uh, subdural hematoma, for example. Here's more of a subacute one with intermediate density blood. Um, and it's having mass effect. It's pushing. It's pushing the brain across the midline. This is the, called the Fox, anterior Fox, posterior Fox. And this is midline shift or brain herniation. So this would be beneath the Fox right in here. It's called subfalcine herniation. We're not going to get into all these diseases and stuff right now, but I'm just showing you these are a couple common things that medical students would be expected to know. They would be expected to know what a subdural hematoma is, okay? So this would be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, that the blood is within the cerebral spinal fluid, and this is called the interpeduncular cistern between the midbrain, all right? These are called the cerebral peduncles right here. Uh, this would be blood in the ventricles, an intraventricular hemorrhage, okay? And the ventricles are also big, so that would be called hydrocephalus, dilated ventricles. And there's also fluid outside the brain here, so that's an extraaxial fluid collection, a subdural fluid collection. So we're not, you don't need to know all these in great detail, but just so you've heard of them. Okay, now here's a hemorrhage into the brain parenchyma itself. So this is an intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the basal ganglia, a typical hypertensive hemorrhage. The little bright spots here in the globus pallidi are just incidental calcifications, which we call incidental, but in reality it's a sign of atherosclerosis and hypertension and decreased function of the globus pallidi. But we just call it a normal variant because they see it all the time. I see that in tons of patients. I see that so commonly... Lots of doctors don't even mention it in their reports. Okay, here is a larger uh, intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the basal ganglia, which is then uh, dissected in its way into the lateral ventricle. So now you can see the blood is flowing into the lateral ventricle. So this patient is at very high risk to die. Okay, when you get a big intraparenchymal hemorrhage that ruptures into the ventricle, those patients often die. This patient will probably survive with a neurologic deficit. Okay, here's a large old stroke in the right middle cerebral artery territory. So this patient's going to have weakness on the other side of the body because the fibers of the cortical spinal tract cross over in the medulla, and thus the deficit, the neurologic deficit, will be weakness on the left side of the body, even though the stroke was on the right side of the body. This lucency, abnormally uh, lucent brain, meaning fluid-filled brain, encephalomalacia, destroyed brain from chronic silent strokes due to cerebral vascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, overtreated hypertension, very commonly I'll see this. And these patients are often very slow. And you'll get ex vacuo dilation of the cerebral ventricles, meaning that as this brain tissue is destroyed and um, being replaced by fluid, these uh, lateral ventricles will expand outward. It's called ex vacuo, meaning that they're expanding into empty space. Okay, here's the typical brain. See, this is what I see most commonly in demented brains. I see an atrophic brain. So the brain is shrunken down and you get expansion of the cerebral spinal fluid anteriorly. So this is an atrophic, shrunken brain. This is a typical brain I see in a demented patient. A normal, healthy brain, a younger brain, these um, gray matter ribbon is up close near the skull. We call that a, a young brain, a tight brain, meaning that it's tight up against the skull. Okay, here's just a little bit on, on MRI. And of course, as a medical student, nobody's going to expect a medical student to read a brain MRI. You know, senior residents in radiology can't read brain MRI that well, okay? We do a neural fellowship to get good at reading this stuff. But just a couple things to know. You could know that the fluid is dark on brain MRI on a T1 sequence. Fluid is bright on a T2 sequence. If you, that's the only thing you need to know about brain MRI at this point. And you can think of that's like knowing animal kingdom, plant kingdom in, in um, zoology, all right? So basically, here's a midline sagittal brain like we just looked at those pictures. So here's the brain stem. Here would be the uh, 
the cervical spinal cord. Here's the medulla of the brainstem, the pons of the brainstem, the midbrain. Okay, now here's where the third ventricle level is. Here's the lateral ventricles up here. Here's the corpus callosum going from side to side. Here is the cingulate gyrus just above it, going from front to back and wrapping around into the medial temporal lobe. Here's the medial temporal lobe. So this ends up in continuity with the cingulate gyrus right in here. Okay. Um, these are the frontal horns. Here's the third ventricle in here. Here's the hippocampus in here. So I'm just showing you what stuff looks like on brain MRI. All right, and then this is what silent strokes look like. So here is the centrum semiovale because you're in the center of the brain, the deep white matter, and it's sort of shaped like an oval. Okay. Here is the corona radiata, and that's at the level of the lateral ventricle. So this would be a patient. That's what I meant by I could see a thousand silent strokes in a day because the same patient could have tons of them. I mean, how do you count these? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You know, right there, I'm going to probably count at least 15 little silent strokes. I see this all day long, every day. A typical American has tons of these by the time they get to their 70s and their 80s especially. And don't get me wrong, I see other patients that are 85 years old and their brain's totally normal. There'd be none of these at all. Okay, but the more hypertension, diabetes they have, the more of this stuff they get. And the more of that stuff they get, the sooner they're likely to die and the more debilitated they are. So here's an acute stroke. So this would be, a, we're in the frontal lobe here and it's along the convexity. It's a middle cerebral artery territory. So this would be an acute infarct infarct means stroke, in the uh, right frontal lobe convexity, okay? And you can see focally destroyed brain tissue due to a lack of uh, blood flow delivery to it. These are a bunch of little microbleeds on a special sequence of brain MRI called susceptibility weighted imaging. And the point of this is that you get those microbleeds centrally is typical for hypertension. When you get them out in the periphery, that's typical for so-called cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It's a disease associated with so-called Alzheimer's. But here's the reality. They're both associated with hypertension. I tell you that because I see these things all the time. And I very often see central and peripheral in young patients with hypertension. Okay. Um, this is just another example of a more uh, bigger bleed. This is a macro bleed, you know, a big hypertensive acute hemorrhage. Where these are often asymptomatic initially. And the patient can have hundreds of them, same patient. Okay, here is normal looking brain tissue. Here there's abnormal enhancement. Enhancement means to take up intravenously injected contrast, IV contrast. So this would be a big brain tumor, like a big metastatic brain tumor. And all this white stuff here is just the enhancement where the blood-brain barrier is broken down so it's the contrast is accumulating in the periphery of this tumor that's hypervascular but lacks a blood-brain barrier. Okay, so this would be an abnormal brain, big dilated ventricles, and lots of silent strokes. And this would be a normal brain, normal-sized ventricles. You can get a tiny bit of hyperintensity at the tips of the frontal horns. That's normal, though, okay? So this is a normal brain. This is what you hope your brain looks like. And this would be like a typical, you know, 75-year-old, 80-year-old American who's cognitively slow. And I had a friend who did a uh, residency. Here, we'll go back up to that. I had a friend who did a residency next to uh, Chinatown, where a lot of the older Chinese people were still eating a lot of uh, rice diets. And uh, she noticed it was remarkable how good these old Chinese people's brains looked. And they were relatively tight, that means non-atrophied, and relatively few silent strokes. And again, that's in that low-fat rice diet. The problem where they get in trouble if they're like Japanese in the 1960s, smoking a lot of cigarettes, um, that can make them rather hypertensive. Um, so they can end up with a whole bunch of silent strokes. They did have a lot of silent strokes, the smokers. But if you just eat the healthy diet and you don't smoke, you can have a really good looking brain all the way up into your 80s and 90s. Okay. This is the glymphatic system. And what this means is, first of all, you got cerebral spinal fluid that surrounds the brain. It's been likened to a water helmet for cooling of the brain, for removal of waste products. Okay, and it'll drain into the arachnoid uh, granulations, which are just connections between the cerebral spinal fluid and the venous sinuses, the normal venous blood of the brain. Here's superior sagittal sinus, okay? So sinus just means big vein, okay? And now this is just showing the, the purple stuff is the skull here, so I'm kind of showing you how it all wraps around. Cerebral spinal fluid flows around the brain. It actually goes down and flows around the spinal cord as well.
And the brain does have lymphatics in the, in the dura, the dura mater, the hard uh, part of the meninges on the outer coating of the brain, and they then drain into the neck. But there's no lymphatic tissue in the brain parenchyma itself. Okay? Glymphatic is a combination word from glial, supporting cells of the brain, and lymphatics, glymphatics. And this system runs at night. You can't run the, I'll show you a better picture of it. You can't run the glymphatic system in the day because you have to maintain precise um, ionic milieu to maintain your neuron gradient so they can function effectively in the daytime. While you're, you have to be online in the daytime. But at night you're sleeping and your brain's going to turn off and they become like Victorians that dump out their chamber pots of waste into the street at night and hopefully the rain will come and rinse it away. So what that means in the brain is you have a little space that accompanies arteries as they enter brain parenchyma and it's called the perivascular space of Verkhal Robin. And cerebral spinal fluid will flow into these areas in larger amounts at night while the person's sleeping and then it'll rinse across the brain parenchyma. These are neurons here and they'll dump out these little brown things. Those will be their waste products. Their, and uh, cerebral spinal fluid will rinse those over towards the venous side and then they'll be carried towards the arachnoid granulations and villi to be excreted out of the body. There's some removal at the capillary level as well but through the glymphatic system going up into the dura lymphatics is um, the key thing to know about the glymphatic system and the key thing to know is it only happens at night and because your neurons clean themselves out and remove their waste products at night that's why we're smartest first thing in the morning. When you wake up your neurons are ready to go. They've gotten rid of all their waste products, they've had plenty of time to rest, they got their ATP ready to go, you are ready to crank out the most difficult intellectual work you ever do. That's why you always want, if you're serious about academics, when you have a study day, you want to, as soon as you get out of bed, you want to sit right down at your desk and start studying. Don't eat breakfast, don't exercise, don't do anything. Sit at your desk and get to work. That makes you way more efficient in getting a lot of work done for the day. Uh, this lady, uh, Macon Nettergaard, I think she's from the Netherlands or something, she was the great discoverer of the uh, glymphatic system. Okay, So she probably should get a Nobel Prize. Um, so here is the artery coming into the brain, penetrating artery of the brain. Um, and again, this cerebral spinal fluid around, it's called the perivascular space of Verkhal Robin, and it opens up at night, gets wider, and it's CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, then rinses across from the arterial side to the venous side. Neurons pump out their waste products, like Victorians emptying out their chamber pots of waste, the feces, whatever you want to call it, and then the waste products get rinsed over towards the venous side, and then they get expelled, okay, from the, from the brain area. So that's how the brain clears out its waste product, and that's why we are smartest first thing in the morning when we wake up, and that is called the glymphatic system. Okay, and that's it. So anyways, I hope that was helpful to you guys. Uh, good luck with uh, learning your neuroanatomy, and I think, you know, once you push past all the, the challenges of the memorization in the beginning, it's kind of overwhelming. I think you will later find that the brain is really interesting, and I enjoy it, and that's why I chose to go into a brain-related field. So anyways, hope that was helpful.